What's up, Psychedelics Spotlight Podcast? Boy, do we have a treat for you today, and that is because I am here interviewing one of my psychedelics heroes, Dr. Matthew Johnson. Now, I know that for most of you guys, not, most of you watching this podcast, you don't need an introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyhow. Dr. Matthew Johnson is a man of many talents. He is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He's one of the leading voices and scientists in the psychedelics world. His work on tobacco addiction using psilocybin is one of the real foundational documents of the psychedelic space. And as I learned today, he is also a comedian. I watched a conference he gave today and he had the crowd roaring in laughter. But on top of all of those things, I think the thing that sets Dr. Johnson apart is I view him more as a philosopher than anything else. His ability to think deeply about the subject in a variety of podcasts and really cut through all of the noise and get to the issue, the deep-rooted issues, is really impressive. So I am so excited. Dr. Johnson, thank Thanks, you so James. much for doing this. Call me Matt. Pleasure. I will call you Matt. Alrighty, so I guess let's start with your research. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Johns Hopkins using smoking or treating smoking cessation with psilocybin and any other projects you're working on? Yeah, so um, conducted a lot of research at Hopkins over the last 17 years with psilocybin and, and, and healthy normals, looking at mystical experience and personality change, meditation, religious professionals, therapeutically with cancer distress and depression, but the smoking cessation is what I talked about today, and that's really a, a real baby of mine, going back to 13 years or so when I cooked up the idea and, you know, wrote a protocol. How did you it, come up with the idea? So it, I had been, there was this, this, this signal based on the early work in the 60s and also just anecdotes if you listen to people of addiction recovery across different substances. You know, uh, alcohol, you know, cocaine, mm -hmm. opioids, etc. I mean, there's, there's these stories across a bunch of different substances and so, um, I was very interested to see whether smoking would fit into that, that category. I had had a lot of research experience. Um, even in those early days, I'd been doing smoking research for years, going back to my earliest days in graduate school. And so it was an area that I was already steeped in in terms of understanding that form of addiction and, and understanding its treatments. And um, it was also a very interesting question. Like one, something, something I struggled over was, do psychedelics only help people when you, with drugs that typically associate with sort of a rock bottom effect, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Like I remember the, the commercials when I was like, in the, the early 80s as a kid, you know, Your the guy- on drugs? Well, that, but I'm actually thinking of one that's <laughs> gotten less notoriety. The guy's on the floor of the bath, public bathroom, he spills this cocaine, <laughs> he's trying to <laughs> scrape it up on the, on the tile with the dried up urine and everything, you know? So it's like, do you have to hit rock bottom, like mm -hmm. with hardcore alcoholism or, you know, you name it, cocaine, heroin? Or does a drug like tobacco that typically isn't associated with so-called rock bottom effects, can, can you address that addiction? I mean, typically no one's, you know, spouse has left them because of their smokes. <laughs> typically they haven't ruined their career. They're not mm -hmm. alienated from their children because of smoking. It, there's exceptions, but of course. it's an addiction. In terms of killing people, it kills far more than any other addiction. And so, you know, there's this real scientific curiosity. Can it help with this form of addiction? It clearly so, is addiction. Can it? Let's get to some of the results. The that you data found. suggests it's it's still early days, but it, it looked really promising. In our pilot study, we had a sick, uh, an eighty percent biologically verified success rate six months after they quit smoking with psilocybin. Eighty percent. Eighty percent. That's twelve out of fifteen. Does anything else come even close to that? Nothing in the scientific literature had ever come close to that. Um, you know, the caveat is it was a non-randomized, open-label pilot study, so mm -hmm. we could have gotten lucky. We could it could have been something besides the psilocybin. But you're attempting to repeat it right now. Right. So you know, those promising data really just told us hey, it was safe and looked promising. Is it worthy of follow-up? Apps of freaking loot league mm -hmm. was able to hustle up the funding thank, for additional research thanks to the Hefter Research Institute, particularly Cody Swift, um, was able to move into uh, a larger randomized study, which we're um, mostly through with now. And right now, at, a, at the year-long follow-up, um, 59% of people from a single psilocybin session at one year 
are biologically verified, smoke-free with psilocybin, compared to 28% with nicotine patch. Those results could change because that study's in progress. Um, this kind of seems like a but, game changer to me. Like hearing you throw out these numbers, it seems like we're on the verge of helping a lot of people that want to be helped, but up until this point haven't really had the opportunity to. Right, and all of these people I've mentioned in these studies have been treatment resistant. In other words, they've mm -hmm. tried multiple it's the worst other of the things. Worst. Yeah, the yeah, they've tried other the other things and they're still smoking. And so, yeah, again, you know, I want, you know, you want to, as a scientist, ride that, you know, find that Goldilocks between, like, yeah, I need to really emphasize, like, this, this seems to be paradigm shifting. It seems mm -hmm. to be really big in mental health treatment, including addiction, including well, smoking. But it's not good. Nothing's going to work mm -hmm. for everyone. Mm -hmm. We have to follow the data. We have to, you know, um, it's. You know, there's going to be people that it doesn't work for. We have to understand more about it, but it's still really promising. And as a scientist, you have to be careful with your words. You have to couch everything in sort of like um, uh, give disclaimers and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't come close to the big C word, the cure word at all. <laughs> um, but do you think that this could be a quote unquote cure? I'll say this, for some people, it looks more like a cure. Okay. And it, it, I mean, that's like much like what, you know, of course, the, the great work that MAPS has done with MDMA and PTSD, same thing there. Lot, same, same thing with, um, oh, certainly in the work we did with cancer patients. A lot, in a lot of these cases, you know, a lot of individual cases look so much like mm -hmm. cures because with these different disorders, it really seems that people have gotten to the psychological roots of those disorders. You're not just treating surface symptoms. And once it's resolved, you have an escape velocity mm -hmm. there. You, so I'm so yeah. happy you brought up the MAPS trial because in talking about a cure here, I believe the language that they use, they're using MDMA to try to treat PTSD in individuals. And they found that 68% of people uh, the language is something along the lines of improved so much that they no longer considered to have the diagnosis right. of PTSD. And that seems like they're trying sounds to... Sounds like cure. Sounds, like cure. <laughs> it sounds more cautious, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yep, yep. Um, so I'm going to pivot gears here for a second uh -huh. because I want to talk about the drug that I find most interesting in this space. And it's actually uh, in learning about this drug is what got me interested in the psychedelic space hmm. in the first place, and that is DMT. Mm. So for mm. any people that are... Uh, familiar with what the subjective feelings of a DMT trip is like, when you take a high enough dose, you appear to enter some sort of other realm where maybe there's autonomous beings that are perhaps interacting with you. So I guess my question for you is, what the hell is happening there? Is this just <laughs> a, something that's happening in the brain that can be explained using neurochemistry, or could there perhaps be something larger at play here, something spiritual, something else? You're the I scientist. I like this question, James. Um, and you know the best questions are the ones where you're not going to get a, a, a good answer from me because it's like I wish we had the data. But um, I'll say this, and I, I've looked into this quite a bit. We did some survey, you know, work with DMT with these experiences of the of the other of mm -hmm. of, 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 of the of the alien of the angels of the self dribbling basketballs, whatever yeah, you want to yeah, call yeah. them. These autonomous uh, the perception of these entities. We can't. And, and the same general caveat applies to you know people having an experience that they might interpret as an experience of God mm -hmm. or any sort of religious or spiritual belief the science is really cannot simply just cannot speak to the ultimate ontological reality or lack thereof of those experiences we can study phenomenology meaning we can study the experience what people say about the experience but we ultimately can't say whether that you know whether that entity is mm -hmm. real or not. We can't say it's not real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have any evidence <laughs> that it's real, but I can't, if someone believes it's real, I don't have any evidence to convince them that it's not real. Same as an experience of God. So I think that's particularly important in doing science in this area that it's fascinating to study people's reactions to these big picture questions like, are you visiting other dimensions? Are, is this the realm of, 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 of God? Is this other, are these the other dimensions the physicists talk about? Who knows? They're fun speculations. But we have to be very cautious of what our empirical science can speak to and what it can't. And, we, and it's totally appropriate to understand people's experiences, what they say about them, 
but you got to be very careful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get on colleagues about the language, <laughs> like we have to be very cautious about not, this is not an endorsement of the reality or a, 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 you know, we're also not refuting the reality of, of of these experiences. Well, the thing that I find particularly interesting about DMT experiences is how uh, similar people's stories seem to be. If you and I both do take a bag of mushrooms, we might have a completely different experience. But when you listen to a lot of DMT stories, there's often the, on a low dose the, uh, the sensation that the reality is realer than real. If you take a little bit more, you enter a tunnel. Uh, if you take a little bit more, you enter another dimension where there are uh, and they're described differently, different cultures describe the experience di differently, but there seems to be some sort of congruence there of entering another space and interacting with beings. And you would, I, I, I personally just find the fact that so many people have the same experience as opposed to a bunch of different random experiences. Yeah. Very interesting. Although it's, it, it's, it's a difficult experiment to run, yes. the cultural contamination. I will note, that, you know, a number of people s seem to have, like, you know, I mentioned self-dribbling basketballs, yeah. which, of course, is the Terrence, Terrence classic McKenna, Terrence yeah. McKenna experience. I think if, you're, if you've listened to dozens of hours or hundreds of hours of Terrence McKenna on YouTube, <laughs> like I have and so many folks have, not, if that's... He's not the most conservative with his language. What? <laughs> no, 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 and he wasn't trying to be. Yes. But if, if, if that's the account that you've been exposed to, that can potentially shape your experience. So it's mm -hmm. no surprise mm -hmm. that if you've heard... Terrence talked about his experience that you might end up having self-dribbling basketball. So it's very hard to tease, or self-transforming machine elves is the other yes. way he puts it, which I, I love these, these phrases. Um, so I don't know, like with ayahuasca, which of course contains DMT and it's taken orally, you know, a classic is like an experience of a jaguar and that type of thing. So I'm frankly more skeptical of okay. the commonality, like that those are anything more than cultural artifacts. Okay. I'll say I can't definitively right, right. say that it's anything more than that. It could be. Some of the things, like a sense of entering the tunnel, to me that, that gets a little more likely that, that there is a commonality, like you're, you're probably pushing the right buttons for having a certain like spatial you know, localization of a sense of self in time and space that maybe that is related. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a very common experiences and just the fact that people are experiencing entities I think to me that that speaks to something probably common that you're you're somehow pushing the buttons associated with mm -hmm. that sense of self and other you know at a very fundamental biological level the nature of the other though yes. whether <laughs> it's an alien whether it's a it's an elf whether it's a you know an angel whether it's a a, a machine elf that's probably culturally painted. I want to believe. Like I, I <laughs> <laughs> we got Mulder over yeah, here. Exactly. Um, so one last. Am question. I playing Scully? Uh, yeah. Perhaps, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> I don't even know what we're referencing right now. <laughs> oh, I'm the sorry. X Files. The come on. Okay, my bad. <laughs> um, so one last question on DMT and also a little bit of LSD, I guess, in here. I want to know if you've ever attempted to look into any of the kind of black ops studies that say the CIA or other groups did using these oh, sure. type of uh, these type of drugs for maybe te telepathy or maybe uh, well whatever mm -hmm. they were doing if you've looked into it to see what the results were so we often hear like the CIA used LSD to try to uh, promote like telepathy or whatever but we never hear if they discovered yeah. anything you know there was a lot of this research and there was a whole range I mean the most unethical stuff was done by the CIA, and yeah. for interested folks, like Lee and Schlein's Acid Dreams is really the definitive account based on a great book based on um, declassified documents from the Freedom of Information Act. But there was also work that went on uh, by the Army, mm -hmm. um, which in the scheme of things was, you know, way more ethical than what the <laughs> CIA, I mean CIA was doing something like dosing people yeah. visiting a sex worker without their knowledge to see. Dosing the sex workers, the people in there, and even the CIA agents watching it were Yeah, their fellow dosed. CIA yeah. agents sometimes. And so it was, a, it, it, you know, obviously some highly unethical stuff. But some of the stuff that the Army was doing, not necessarily so unethical. Okay. Um, but, but nonetheless, the overall context, trying to look at, at these things as interrogation agents or incapacitating agents. But a part of that work, and 
you know, I don't recall whether this was more the Army or the CIA, but there was that work, and I, I, I can't really cite you the details. I don't know how many details. I think probably the most extensive I read about that might be from Acid Dreams. Uh, also some work in the, the, the Psy, um, in, in the Psy um, area. I'm thinking of some, uh, some of the books by, by, by Dean Radin, I think, mm -hmm. has written about that history of you know, claims of remote viewing, you know, the folks that could see a nuclear submarine being <laughs> built up in Siberia. That's that that, wild. So I don't know. I, yeah. it, it's hard to, you know, it's interesting that this was being looked at at very <laughs> serious levels. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think we have published data that are, right. you know, anywhere close to definitive on that type of thing. Okay, so I got a softball question for you. I love softball. What is consciousness? Oh, man, you <laughs> tricked Dude, they call it the hard problem for exactly. a reason. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote, recently wrote a commentary, one of my big takeaways. We just need more precise language when we say consciousness. Okay. Kind of the biggest C, you know, is <laughs> phenomenal consciousness. Um, that is the, just addressing, uh, and this is the source of the so-called hard problem with David Chalmers. You want to just he quickly put that, describe what the hard problem is? Yeah, yeah, is? and Chalmers put that name on it, the hard problem, but it had been written about by numerous people, Nagel, and then going back you know, you know, deeper into history. The, the, just the, why is there experience, period? Mm -hmm. Why is there any subjectivity versus not? What and is it you're like? you answer that. Right, right, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll notice I'll talk a lot and it won't give you any, any answer like a great, like a politician. It, the, 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 why, what is it like to be, uh, Nagel described it, what is it like to be something? Presumably there's an experience of a bat mm -hmm. or of my, my dog or of you. I don't have any direct experience that you're having an experience, no evidence that you're having an experience, but it really seems like I'm having an experience and you seem like another human like me, so it's kind of a, a good mm -hmm. presumption, but Probably. it is a presumption that you're having an experience. Maybe you're the only person on the planet and we're all NPCs. Right. <laughs> I, this may be the only experience that's ever been as the one, and yeah. I don't have, and that's the hard problem. Yeah. There is, it seems that there's no possibility of empirical testing uh, of the nature, uh, or even proving that there is subjective experience outside of our own felt sense of a subjective experience. So that's the hard problem. There are others. So I'm not holding my breath for psychedelics to solve that problem. And as far as I know, there's no credible even ideas on how to leverage psychedelics to use that. That said, I'm very open. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful, but I'm not holding my breath. Other things that are called consciousness, such as, which are, well, short of the hard problem, but um, what is the nature of, uh, of self-representation or of having a sense of self? That's a much more attractable problem that we can understand the biology. I mean, you can build a computer to have a, a structure of demonstrating behaviorally a sense of self. Ultimately, you don't know whether there is an experience of a sense of self because that's the phenomenal consciousness, but you can understand the machinery and the behavior that goes along with having a, a sense of, of self. And so that's another aspect of consciousness. Okay. Another aspect of consciousness is access consciousness. You weren't thinking access? about access. Access, okay. Like, okay, so you weren't thinking of unicorns five seconds ago, but you are now simply because I mentioned that. You had some representation of what a unicorn and is somewhere in your, in, your, in your brain, in, but you pulled it out and now you're thinking of it. You've accessed it. And where did this thought in your brain come from? Did, your, did you come up with it or did it just enter in and come out? Yeah, now we're getting into free will. Why the <laughs> yes. unicorn versus the tooth fairy versus, uh, you know, who, your grandmother, I've sometimes said in those examples, you're not thinking of your grandmother now. So I don't know. I don't okay. know. That's, it seems to be random. It just popped into my head. But you, now you're going to ask me about free will, right? You're giving Do me all the softballs, exactly. James. Come on. Um, I'm I don't know. By the yeah. end of this interview, we will have <laughs> solved mental health, figured out what consciousness is, and final question for you: What the heck is going on with UFOs? I love it, man. <laughs> you got me on the ropes. You giving me the tough ones. Um, so yeah, we we the other night had a, a brief discussion a, yes. at a reception about this, and uh, uh, and uh, he said I'm intrigued by the evidence, and I just like in my si professional scientific realm, I want to be. A radical empiricist. Could meaning, you perhaps just quickly lay out bullet points? What is the evidence that you're intrigued by? Um, these various. Well, let me first get to my. Okay, my perfect. conclusion is I don't know, but I would say it's more likely than not that there's some type of extraterrestrial 
reality okay. to the and visit. They're here. I don't know that. Right. Yeah, yeah. I would say that's a very plausible explanation and might you know, be more likely than not based on the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the sightings by various instruments, you know, the, the, obviously the Nimitz encounter, mm -hmm. it, it, multiple trained observers from radically different perspectives with infrared and, 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 and straight up video and radar and just and then how oh, the the various encounters over the decades seemingly tied to nuclear sites of one type yeah. which is really intriguing if you were to start to ask questions like if this if there was a reality this what would they be interested in why would they and, and the focus on this technology that could realistically mm -hmm. you know end our species that's kind of interesting if that were somehow a yes. focus <laughs> like if i was if we fast forward ourselves millions of years and if we discovered another civilization what we would be be interested in are they going to blow themselves up i mean this has been written yeah. about for decades yeah. uh, about you know if there is life intelligent life in the, in, in the universe you have to pass all of these steps you had to be on the right type of planet and you had to get past that point in your evolution where you develop technologies bioweapons nuclear weapons that can destroy your entire species and do you make it past that and we don't know whether we're going to make it past that what's that paradox called it's the we have to get past the uh, i'm blanking on it oh well uh it doesn't yeah. matter <laughs> yeah i think i know what you're talking about i'm not i'm, not, I'm yeah, blanking but, on it too the the yeah, yeah why are they it, it, like what is the point probability that we have to, pass, the, uh, to reach the stars essentially right. anyhow we're getting a little bit off topic uh, <laughs> at, whereas ufos is totally on topic for a psychedelic <laughs> right. <conference>, of course <laughs> But, um, yeah, so I guess, are you good for time? I guess we can wrap this up if you want. Yeah, I mean, a, a couple minutes, but, but yeah, right. yeah, so yeah. So closing should... thoughts. Uh -huh. Where do you think, bring, bringing it back to psychedelics, we did UFOs, we did consciousness. Where do you think psychedelics <laughs> are going in the next five years? Oh, gosh, I think within the next five years, we're probably going to see the approval um, of both MDMA and psilocybin for, you know, MDMA for PTSD, psilocybin for depression, probably mm -hmm. the first. Probably also within the next five years, I would say smoking cessation and alcohol use disorder within the next five years. I think probably approval, this all depends on the data. I'm not getting ahead <laughs> of the data. Um, but those were where my bets would, would be at. But that's just going to be the beginning mm -hmm. because there's, oh, I mean, there's dozens you think it of could the transform disorders. Society? Let's say, let's fast forward 30 years and let's. Give, us, give ourselves an optimistic outlook right. and say psychedelics are now widespread. You can use them recreationally, perhaps, or at least some of them. Do you think that would transform society? And if so, in which ways? Well, the scientist in me makes me answer, well, by definition, that's going to be transformation <laughs> because something will be different. How big is that transformation going to be? What, what are the ripple like? effects? Yeah. Is it going to make human beings you know, kinder and gentler on average and make war less likely? I don't know. There's, there is very good reason to speculate, I would say, that there's, it's not going to be a universal... I, I see much more of a, a, a valence, like neutral aspect to psychedelics okay. that we have a lot to figure out here, but they, they, can, be, neutral. Uh -huh. they can be pushed towards um, the negative. Um, it, it, they don't necessarily lend themselves to pro-social. We talked about the CIA right. earlier. Charlie Manson used them yeah. to brainwash the pe were like people. Yes, were like a death cult at times. Yes, that human they sacrifice. They yeah. used psychedelics in the context of. So, um, you know, I think we've got to be very careful. On average, what it's going to look like, certainly in the therapeutic context, um, I, 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 I think it's pretty clear, and if we keep doing things right, um, there are more so pro-social benefits. People mm -hmm. seem to be, based on the evidence, you know, kinder and gentler, and you know, mm -hmm. more appreciative of art and uh, the personality openness find finding that we had. People more tolerant of other people's points of views. Those are going to be a good thing to the degree to which they. This is a ripple effect from mm -hmm. this treatment. I, you know, I, I just I think we've got to be careful of. of not thinking that psychedelics are going to automatically, you know, they're not going to transform society into a utopia. I do think that, I mean, we are in that period where in the next 100, 200,000, whatever it is, maybe next decade, we're in that period where we're going to... Somewhere gonna, between 10 years and 1,000 yeah, years. But in evolutionary time, it's basically right, now. Right. Like in terms of our evolution as a species, we're either going to snuff ourselves out or we're going to make it into the stars and colonize planets in the coming centuries. And that's going to be determined essentially now in terms of whether it's yeah, 500 years or, or, or five years from now. 
Will psychedelics play a role in helping us through that? Um, I hope so, but I also want to say a lot of other things will. Appreciating mental health across the board, healthcare for human beings across the board, access to water across the board. All of these things are not destroying our a planet. huge part. It's not just psychedelics. Not destroying our planet. It's not just psychedelics. Are, can psychedelics be a part of that? Um, you know, added into the mix? I think so. Um, but yeah, it's not the only thing. And I always think of this where like, sometimes people, I don't know, they get a little too into it and say, oh, this is the highest level of work and whatnot. And I, you gotta check yourself. Man, there's people that have given up everything to be, you know, helping dying kids of malaria in Africa and whatnot. It's like, yeah. it's like okay, yeah. there's a lot of good that's <laughs> happening in this world. There's a lot of people pushing it, the pedal to the metal, to benefit our species. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, psychedelics, it, it, you know, they're a part of that, but not the only thing. And I think that's a great place to end it on a note of hope. Hopefully by the next time we'll be talking, we'll both be doing psychedelics on Mars. <laughs> 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 Solve the hard problem of consciousness and chilling with the UFO alien. <laughs> Everybody, Matthew Johnson, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, James. Appreciate it, dude. Perfect.